Welcome to AC Nation Tech Feed Edition, the best in home theater gear, the best in AC content, no matter what your budget is. All the money, none of the money, some of the money, we are here to help you have the most amazing home theater experience we can help you deliver. Always. 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 He's okay. Patrick Norton. <laughs> He's Robert Heron. <laughs> We're going to talk Speaker Placement 101. we got a dog pile of viewer questions today. And there's some interesting news for anybody that wants a 4K camcorder to go with their 4K Ooh. Ultra HD TV. Hey, but first, let's talk Speaker Placement 101. Speaker placement is fundamental to getting the best audio quality to your ears and the most accurate surround sound effects. Now, there are technologies like Odyssey's Multi-EQ that are designed to compensate for funky room designs and even funky speaker placement, and they can do a great job. But you're always better off starting with your speakers in the most optimal position you can get them in. To get your speaker set up, you'll need a tape measure, and if your AVR doesn't have a built-in audio meter, an <laughs> SPL, or sound pressure level meter, which you can pick up online or from your local Radio Shack. We also suggest you head over to the most useful web page we know of for setting up your home theater speakers. Take a look right here at Dolby's Home Theater Speaker Guide. And it's really funny. So, you know, they have sections 2.1, 5.1, 7.1. Um, you open up the home theater speaker guide. You select your viewing distance, like a small room, 6 to 8, a big room. Or a, let's, let's set up a monster, ridiculous 2.1 system for 12 feet plus. And it gives you some really basic information. Your seating position and its relationship to the screen. Now, there's a couple fundamentals they're not really going to talk too much about. But we want you to know, ideally, the tweeters for your speakers are at your ear level when you're seated. Now, if you're setting it up in a bar, put them at ear level while you're standing and you are creating a sweet spot for you, the apex of a triangle. Now, if we take a look at that, you can see the triangle really, really clearly. This is like the perfect seat. That is the prime seat, the queen seat, whatever you want to call it. The and money seat. The money seat that is dead center on your television and with an equal, basically, an equilateral triangle. It's yep. been so long nope, since that I did is, geometry. That is it, exactly. <laughs> basically, the distance between the two front speakers and that distance to each speaker to your seated position. And the thing that really varies, this is a basic 2.1 setup. They put the subwoofer here. We'll talk about subwoofer placement in a second. But you'll notice, you know, at six to eight feet, the speaker is going to be about 30 degrees from dead center on that perfect seat. And then as the room gets longer, the angle is going to, well, pretty much stay the same for 12 plus feet. Oh, <laughs> totally. You probably have to get to about a 25 foot room to see a significant change in that. Um, so left and right speakers, whether it's 2.1, 5.1, 7.1, are always going to be the same. The other one that's always going to be the same is your center channel. Ideally, your center channel would be right there in the center of your screen, because that's where the dialogue is coming from. When they punch up a 5.1, a 7.1 soundtrack, all of your dialogue, all of your fundamental action is coming from that center channel. Yes, you've got left and right channels, but they really do concentrate the talking. If it's in the center of the screen, it's going to come from the center channel. Unfortunately, most of us can't actually display or put no. a, a we, well, we can put the center channel in front of the screen. Sure. You but can, you never want to block the view, of course. Okay. You can put the center channel behind the screen, which is what they do at a movie theater, but most of us don't actually have, you, that's going to block the audio. That too, unless you're dealing with something like a, an acoustically transparent screen, right. like in terms of projection setups. But for TVs, it's typically going to be below or above. Yeah. And that's pretty much your only option on that one. So we should probably, let's skip over here on the home theater speaker guide and talk about surround sound speaker locations. Basically, this is a 5.1 setup, your center channel under, underneath the, the HDTV screen at this point, your left and right channels stay the same, and these are basic 5.1 surrounds Note or th fills. that they're actually pointed directly at the head of the, or the, basically the seated position of the person. Uh, our mythical viewer. Yes, <laughs> our mythical dot right there in the middle. They're not, they're not directed back or up or any other direction. Right. They're actually aimed right at you at and you're trying to maintain that ear level placement. Mm -hmm. And that's really most important also for the tweeters that might be present in the speakers as well. Tweeters, the high, the high frequency speakers, tend to be very directional. So not only do you want them at the proper height, but you really want to make sure they're pointed right at the listening position so that you're getting the best effect out of it or you're yeah. getting the most sound possible from that speaker. In a lot of cases, you know, this is the ideal situation where you have a dedicated home theater room. You know, there may be the, what's the thing above a fireplace? The, the mantle. mantle. The mantle may be in a place. There may be bookshelves. There may be spousal obligations, you know, to the home theater speaker placement. And maybe no matter how you try, he won't let you put the speakers where you want to. Yes, and that's where you can start doing things like putting them up in the corners or up on surrounds level or up on, you know, sort of up the, the crown of the room where the, where, the, where the ceiling, where the ceiling and the wall meet. It's like a corner up there, kids. Yeah. Um, but in that case, try, if at all possible, don't leave the speakers up there, you know, with this, if this was a speaker 
and I'm putting it way up at the top of the room. Angle it down towards where the ears are going to be. Don't leave it with the tweeter talking to the tweeter on the other <laughs> side of the room. Aim it. Don't <laughs> tilt send, it. Send the sound to where you're seated, and that's really yeah. the most important thing. Now, for subwoofers. Well, we should talk about 7.1 real oh, quick yep. before we get to subwoofers. So 7.1 obviously adds the two rear channels, and those are basically going to be at an angle, about 135 to 150 degrees. You're creating another isosceles triangle, this time at the back of the room. So 3.1 or 2.1, and then we've got our 5.1 speakers, and finally the 7.1s are at the back of the room. Is it okay to put 7.1s at a 90 degree angle, or, or should they always be faced through that, that center seating position? I would, again, face them toward the seating position, but those can be mounted much higher than your other, say, the 5.1 setup, where you have just the, the surround speakers on the left and the right. Also, too, when you're placing these speakers, or if you're selecting speakers as well, for as far as camouflaging them within the room. You don't have to go with the traditional black cube if you're going to be hanging speakers on the wall. They come in many colors mm -hmm. nowadays and you can get them color matched to your to your interior to help, you know, to help ease over the spousal acceptance factor, right. so to speak, in terms of can we get more speakers in a room or not? Sometimes sometimes <laughs> it's just, you know, changing the color can make the difference between yes, this is a good idea or no, this is not going to happen in our house, that kind of or body does a great job with that where they have a whole bunch of different colors that are powder coated onto the oh. exterior of their very small and discreet surrounds. Um, subwoofer placement, you're about to talk about it. Yeah. And technically, right, the low-end audio is omnidirectional or non-directional, and you can put your subwoofer anywhere. That doesn't mean you should put your subwoofer anywhere. Is no. there a worse place to put a subwoofer than a corner? Probably not, although depending on if it's an ineffective subwoofer, mm -hmm. you can actually improve its how the bass responds by basically tuning it with that corner and creating almost like a, a reverberation chamber, uh, so to speak, with that. But for generally speaking, most speaker placement, you want to keep the speakers a little bit away from the wall. You don't want mm -hmm. them right up against the wall. You want to give them a little bit of room around there, a couple of feet if you can do it. Mm -hmm. And likewise, uh, as far as the sub goes, if you can figure out one idea would be then along the walls is to just simply have the sub at the center point because mm -hmm. that typically is one of the areas where you end up with a null spot in terms of audio reproduction in the room. A spot where the sound suddenly takes a dip because of standing waves that occur from the, the, basically the output of the speakers. Mm -hmm. Now without using a test soundtrack to really isolate where those, where those null points are, that's a little bit harder to do. But if you can do that, you want to put that sub right in the null point and it will help negate it and help and basically even out the sound field within the room environment. It's kind of like the, the opposite of the tuner trick where you put the subwoofer, you put the subwoofer in sort of the prime seat. You would actually set the subwoofer there, then you would walk around the room until you found out where it was sort of loudest or softest or you know at least just didn't where the audio didn't change. Those are all optional locations totally. for the subwoofer there. Totally. And that might be a good demo if we could pull that off. I'll uh, see if we can set up a room where we can create some nulls in there. And I don't know how we can do that other than with a mic to show people where they right. are, but uh, we'll see. We'll get that done. So one of the things, we mentioned uh, uh, Odyssey Multi-EQ earlier in the show. There are other alternative sort of sound processing systems. I, for one, hate sound processing or did until I ran into Multi-EQ because in my case, I had a horrendous room. There was a lot of hard surfaces. It was very, very long. There was a huge open area off to a dining room on the side. The screen was at one corner. It was a nightmare because the room was just not good for propagating. You know, the whole point of putting this precise location of your speakers is so that all the sound hits your ears at the same time. And if you have like one wall really close here and one wall way the heck over there, it can do really strange things with the echoes. Odyssey Multi-EQ actually did a fantastic job of making this weird room layout very, very, very functional and very, very, very usable. So if there's a microphone inside of your AVR, your AV receiver, when you get it, find out what it's for, find out what you can do with it. Because if it can auto calibrate itself, if it can do things like compensate for, you know, it'll, it might change a little bit of the high end or the low end, it might tweak it, totally. it might change the timing. For example, if you end up with like one surround sound speaker that's 12 feet over there and one that's three feet over here because of your really weird room layout or because people don't want to have a speaker stand in the middle of the hallway, something like Odyssey Multi-EQ can compensate for those distances by delaying the timing for when the audio reaches each speaker. That's really cool. That really is. And like we said too, for any AV receiver or even home theater in a box kits, there are adjustments for level and timing available on just about every unit we've seen at every price point. So you can simply take that tape measure and take your, your sound pressure mm -hmm. level meter and do it manually if that's not available. Right. An auto cal feature is not available. Yeah. And I think that's a... Uh, you don't, want, you don't want one speaker that has a higher level than the other speakers in your no. surround sound. I, I, in my setup right now, I have, for the rear channels, one is about two, three feet closer than the other speaker. So mm -hmm. you have to do something there, because otherwise, if, if the same sound is coming out of both speakers, the timing will be off, the levels will be different. There's a lot to correct for, and it's important to take care of that to get the best quality you can. 
All right, so we're working on an AV receiver guide. Literally, we're gonna to try to look at entry-level $250 AV receivers to ones that cost more than I've ever spent on a car. Nice. Uh, but we thought we'd start by answering some questions on our YouTube comments to spell a few myths that are out there. Heroic the Great wrote, I've always thought running an HDMI through a receiver was a bad idea as it would degrade or cause syncing issues. And the best way was to run an optical out to the receiver. So I've had just the opposite experience in general. Mm -hmm. If you're suddenly dealing with HDMI source devices, that's usually synced when it reaches the AV receiver, and it should maintain its sync, especially if it's crafted properly. However, if you're switching that audio then to say, oh, I'm gonna do an, an optical input or, or an analog input even, then it takes additional processing to get that back into and mixed with the other audio stream before it's sent back out. Mm -hmm. I find that I've had more delay issues when, I, when I'm using different types of audio inputs on, on a particular AVR. So that's just one thing I'd recommend right there is if you can, keep it all in HDMI, especially if the source device provides HDMI out. And most, na most receivers nowadays also provide timing, auto timing built in so that if there are multiple right. sources, it will ensure that things stay in sync so that when somebody speaks, it happens right when the lips move and not a second before or after, yeah. which can be incredibly distracting. Also, if that is the case, you also have an option then to change timing manually mm -hmm. as well so that you know if you need to tweak it up forward or backward, you know, a couple milliseconds right. to get it just perfect, you should be able to do that too. Yeah, there are fancy high-end Blu-ray players that'll do things like run two HDMI outs, one to go to your AVR receiver, one to your HDTV. But for most people, in most cases, and most of the time, just <laughs> go from your Blu-ray player or your source device, whether it's an Apple TV or a Roku, into your AV receiver, and then out from your AV receiver into your HDTV. Totally. Bill Wardino says, unless things have changed in the last few years, buying more wattage in an AVR is reasonable. If you want clear sound at low volumes, i.e. in an apartment, etc., one shouldn't buy more wattage for louder sound, but buy it for better sound. Do you guys disagree? Love the show, Bill. I agree. I, Mostly. Yeah, out of the thought. No. I'm going to okay. say no. Here's the deal. You want to buy the best wattage you can buy, right? Because I can go right now, not too far from here, and buy a thousand watt monster amp of doom. But it's crap because it's like 15% total harmonic distortion at the high end. It's basically for a 17-year-old kid with a car that's going to rattle a lot when the, the, the bass kicks in. Right. right? These, you buy a lot of products out there. They're like, we deliver 1,000 watts. Yeah, peak and it's a mess. What's the RMS? What's the standard power? Do, do, do I want all of the horsepower in an app? Yes, but the reality is, is most AVR receivers already have way more power than you can use without blowing out your hearing in a typically sized room. 100 watts per channel, that's not going to impress somebody who's got like, you know, $50,000 worth of watt puppy speakers in a 40 by 40 foot room that he does nothing or she does nothing but listen to audio to. They have a thousand watt monster of doom. I own like a 500 watt crown amplifier. I love it. I used to drive big fat speakers. But in most situations, that's not really going to help me with apartment listening. What is going to help me with apartment listening is doing stuff like some of the audio processing that's available in AVRs where it dynamically compresses the audio. Not a high fidelity thing, not an audio file thing, but if they bring the sound of the explosions down and the sound of the dialogue up, I can hear the thing at two in the morning without waking up everybody in my neighborhood. Totally. Also too, if you have, if you have hearing issues where you're finding it difficult to hear everything mm -hmm. in your setup, that's one thing you can enable that can help. Yeah. Also, I find, what about speaker efficiency though? Having a more efficient yes. speaker would take, no matter what wattage you're putting out, yeah. and make it make better use of it. Yeah, I mean, I, given a choice, I would rather have, you know, 50 watts RMS that's absolutely pure than 100 watts peak with like, you know, umpteen percent RMS, you know, and, and, and you know, it's, it's, yeah, I love wattage. If given the choice for the same money and the same audio quality, yeah, I'll take more, more wattage. But be careful that you're not buying more watts and getting an inferior sound just because you wanted the bigger 144,000 watts on the box. Speaker efficiency, because wattage, because high power amplifiers are so cheap these days, speaker builders have in many cases gotten really, 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 really lazy. Right, so or or speakers have just gotten less efficient because it's less critical. When you're dealing with like 300 B tube amplifiers that had a whopping like six watts, you needed a really efficient speaker to fill a room. When you're dealing with anybody being able to buy a profoundly high quality 100 watt amplifier for next to no money, yeah, 86 dB efficiency is fine. But more, I could go more. on for yeah. a while on this one. More efficiency is good but you can also start spending a lot of money to get some really amazing speakers. Yeah, that's, uh, that's where I'm looking right now. <laughs> Jacob writes, wonder if you guys have ever heard of the Lapai LP 2028 Plus. I have one, it works great for a porch. What do you guys think of it in terms of sound quality, especially for the price? 
This is a lapai. It's available on Amazon.com. I think I paid a whopping $16 for it. Holy cow. Yeah, it's actually pretty amazing. What do you um, use it for? I actually use it, uh, I bought it for a segment trying to put together sort of a $100 entry-level audiophile listening set. Cool. And I'll tell you, I was really, really shocked. So this is what they call a Class T amplifier. They're really cool. Uh, Class T amps were invented by a company called TriPath uh, here in Silicon Valley. They were bought out by Cirrus Logic a few years ago. Um, to greatly oversimplify, these are Class D switching amps that were tuned to do a better job uh, with the audio reproduction. They make really good audio. The T thing is not really a separate class of amplifier. It's a marketing thing that made them look really distinctive. For the money, like I said, I think I paid like $17 for this Lapai amp. They can't be beat. It is a fantastic starter component for a college student. It is a great garage amplifier, and they do a great job uh, feeding better speakers. You nice. know, with, like the, with the $50 speakers that I bought off of Amazon.com, this was okay. Feeding my BMW 601s, I was actually shocked at how good a job this was doing. Now, audiophile people such as myself, you don't want to see, <laughs> you don't want to, it's like, I haven't owned a treble and a bass control on anything with a set of stereo speakers in like a freaking decade <laughs> outside of my car, but actually probably close to 20 years. So it was, it was really funny to see like treble and bass. I remember adjusting these when I was like 17. Up um, the max. These are really fun. There's a whole community that have figured out how to hack and upgrade these. There's like probably 30 different variations of these floating around, some from very reputable manufacturers, some from places like Lapai you've probably never heard of outside of Amazon. One of the first mods you should really think about doing is dropping in a, velo, a, a better pot, a better volume knob, the potentiometer. Upgrading the potentiometer on this is a really, really good idea. And if you search for sort of Lapai or Class T amplifier mods, you'll find a lot of really cool ideas. For home theater, I'd skip them unless you're sticking with a 2.0 audio system. Uh, seriously, save your money until you can save up enough for a proper AVR and surround sound speakers. But if you have like, if money's tight and you want stereo to go with your, your HDTV, this is not a bad place to start. It might be a fun project though to bolt a bunch of these, like get one of Oppo's amazing Blu-ray players that has all the analog out so and then like feed stereo like, pair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we could buy amp these off of that and have like, you know. We only need three of them. Oh my goodness. Or you could do like five of them and buy amp them with a, oh, all right, this is gonna be ridiculous. Crazy. You wanna talk about the HD news making? Yeah. Uh, Let's talk about a little news this week. Red, one of our favorite companies, is taking orders, basically, for their new $1,700.50 Red Ray Professional 4K Cinema Player. Now, the good folks at Big Picture Big Sound reported that hot on that is Sony's FMPX1 4K HD Ultra, or Ultra HD Media Player. Okay, the big weird round box of HD videos. That we all were guessing was a PlayStation 4 <laughs> at CES, but there you go. That is actually currently available for pre-order on Amazon for 700 bucks, and it'll start shipping in mass. No, 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 they're actually selling it on Amazon. It, Where it, did it go? It did say there were three <gasps> there currently is. available, so. And more on the way. And more on the way, so maybe it's on sale today, but in mass, <laughs> at least, starting on the 15th officially. And to quote from the good folks at Big Picture Big Sound, users can stuff the FMPX1's two terabyte hard drive with downloads or feature film titles, which will be available as 24-hour rentals or for purchase, with prices ranging from $799 and $29.99, respectively. Now, we welcome more quad HD content. True 4K in the case of the Red Ray player, that's actually yeah. 4096 by 2160 over the 3820 by 2160, 3840, excuse me. And uh, even though Sony's FMPX1 is only compatible with the Sony Quad HD televisions, at least for now, that's something to keep in mind now. I, I gotta say, I screwed up when I heard red and I saw $700, I automatically thought there was now a $700 4K video camera no. for home users. So for I apologize for that mistake. 1750 for the red, yeah. red Ray player. And yeah. I'd be curious, I wanna see the content they're gonna be offering on that too. But anyway, if you have one of those Sony TVs, a 4K TV, and you should definitely check out a website called 4kactivation.com to see what discounts and special offers are available for your Quad HD TV. That is a good thing. Actually, you can get some discounts on the current streaming hardware cool. if you decide to buy, and it can also just get you pre-registered for some of the content that's coming up, since it's gonna be a Sony exclusive thing, at least for their own player <laughs> for the time being. Moving back from 4K to 1080p, it is July 4th week here in the United States of America. It's always a light week for new Blu-ray releases, though there are a couple of comedy classics coming out, most notably the producers, and I'm gonna call this my pick of the week from the Blu-ray department, Collector's Edition. Mel Brooks' first feature film was a writer, which won him an Oscar, and uh, and Gene Wilder's like really first big movie, comedic genius, you might know him from the original Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. It is funny as hell, and was recently remade into a monster Broadway 
theatrical production that broke records and records and records. Seriously, the 1968 movie is really, really funny. Zero Mostel and Gene Wilder's performances are brilliant. High Def Digest has a review of the disc. Uh, overall, they give it three and a half. There's not much in the way of supplements, but the video quality is and audio quality are outstanding. If you've only seen edited version of these on cable, uh, and you're a fan of the movie, get the Blu-ray. It's going to look fantastic. Also, Kentucky Fried Movie came out oh this week, apparently, <laughs> uh, both from a company called Shout Factory that's doing some pretty cool reissues. And since the list is so short, let me hit you with the rest of the Blu-ray releases. Six Souls, An American Girl, Sage Paints, The Sky, The Curtis Harrington Short Film Collection, The Dick Van Dyke Show, The Complete Fourth Season, E.T., The Extraterrestrial, 30th Anniversary Edition, Horizon in the Middle of Nowhere, Season 2, Inescapable, The Kentucky Fried Movie, The Producers Collectors Edition, Aichi Hero, Tower Block, Venus, and Serena. Did I mention it was just not a big week for Blu-ray releases? Not a good time maybe to go back and check out the classics if you haven't watched a few of those in a while. <laughs> Venus hey. and Serena? Maybe. 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 <laughs> <laughs> one day, anyway. Hey, finally, we get a bunch of tweets. Oh, we got a bunch of tweets with HDTV buying questions. Let's take a look here. One from at Jimmy Flynn. He tweeted, at Robert Heron, what's the best smart but non-3D TV on the market right now? Or what would you suggest in general? Thank you. And at Paul Apostolos tweeted a very similar question at Robert Heron. Robert, can I trouble you for a plasma recommendation? No 3D or built-in apps needed. 60 inch. Love that HD Nation is back. It's, well, it's hard because there's so many than, good options. Well, other than like Seiki, right? Most HD TV companies are like, we're going to checkbox the feature. It's got an onboard computer. It does the Netflix. It does. It's almost harder to find one without the extra stuff than it is to find one with it. Totally. And uh, you know what? You don't really have, I say don't even worry so much about the 3D part or the app part. If it's there, you can always ignore it. Everyone wants that good value when they're shopping for an HDTV. And it's really no different in this case. And basically, those 3D features and the app features are easily ignored if you so choose. Now, <laughs> if you're looking for a good LCD television without a lot of extra baggage, I really like Sharp 6 Series TVs. They are available in 50, 60, 70, and 80 inch screen sizes, 1080p resolution, 120 hertz screen technology, and they're a terrific upgrade option if you have an old rear projection TV. And they're also available online as well as in the local retail and club stores as well. Uh, for plasma TVs, my budget options lean toward the Panasonic ST Series. Uh, we've shown that on the show, actually. It's a superb 1080p picture when properly calibrated, and it's at a price that really won't make you wince. And I think it really offers one of the best values out there going right now. However, mm -hmm. the only other plasma manufacturer I'd consider is Samsung. And their new 5300 series on up all feature 1080p resolution and good contrast performance. For any TV 40 inches or larger, though, I'd make 1080p resolution a must-have yeah. spec to look for when you're shopping. I personally also appreciate built-in Wi-Fi for just easy software updates as well. And finally, if you need to save the money, skip the extended warranties, wall mount that screen for an even cleaner look and enhanced safety. Yeah. And that can uh, also just save you the hassle. I've, I don't know. The I, only I, place left 720p TVs should go is like in a bar if nobody's gonna be within 12 or 15 feet uh, and, of, the, of, the, of the screen. And if you ever see some of the super values in plasmas, mm -hmm. they tend to be really either 720p or even lower resolution right. as well in order to hit that price point. So. I'm just kind of done with dealing with those resolutions. Now that we have Blu-ray and plenty of other content right. at 1080p, and, and also in terms of certain screen features like the overscan control, it's always available, at least nowadays, on 1080p screens. And that's why I'm just like, just go 1080 and be done with it. You got a question for us, do us a favor, send it out to us. You can do it on Twitter if you want to. Uh, Twitter.com slash HC Nation. We are at HC Nation. And that's it for this episode of HC Nation Tech Feed Edition. Please subscribe to the show either on RSS or on YouTube through the Revision 3 Tech Feed lineup. If you want to watch all the shows, you want to download them in any format you want, do us a favor, go to revision3.com slash HD Nation. And that tell us what you think. Is right. Do it. And please send us your comments, questions, or suggestions to HD Nation at revision3.com. And until next time, thank you for watching.